to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in romans chapter 15 verse number four the Bible tells us the things that were written before time were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might find hope. Today we're thinking about, in our lesson, great Bible characters in this series of lessons, and we're going to be looking at men and women of the Bible who are great examples for us to follow for their faith and their courage, and then make application to that for our lives today. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God for our guide in everything that we say and do. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by individuals and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and who are committed to the Word of God as our only guide for salvation today. Won't you check out their assembly on Sunday or Wednesday? You'd be an honored guest there. If you've got a Bible question, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our past lessons on any topic or any book of the Bible, we'd be glad to make that available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a DVD for use in your home or maybe in Bible study group, we'd be glad to send that to you free of charge or a CD so that you can listen to that in your car. And also, very popular and an easy way to get our material is through our digital download. You can go to our media request form on our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll make that available to you, as we said, free of charge. Also, we have transcripts and study questions, uh, good articles, Bible study material, all available from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. And in our fast-paced world today, we have a great way to help utilize our smartphones today. You can download the Gospel of Christ app for both the Apple and Android phones, and that's a great way to utilize that in our fast-paced world today. We welcome you again to our study of great Bible characters. Today we're thinking about maybe one of the unsung heroes of the Old Testament is a man by the name of Phinehas. And so I want to encourage you to take your Bible and open with me to the book of Numbers. We're going to be looking in Numbers chapter 25 together as we study what Phinehas did that really saved Israel and sets a great example for us today. First of all, let's consider who Phinehas was. Phinehas is the grandson of the high priest Aaron. Exodus chapter 6 verse 25 tells us that and Eleazar, the high priest of God, as well. He was one of the chief officers of the Korahites, who the branch of Korah was a part of uh, the Levitical priesthood of the tribe of Levi, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 20. Uh, he later became high priest after his father Eleazar died. But what Phinehas is most well known for is he stopped the plague of death that was going through Israel by his zeal in stepping forward and actually killing someone who was committing ungodliness with a Midianite woman in Numbers chapter 25. In fact, it's this faithful and courageous act that he was involved in that is actually commemorated in Psalm 106 verses 28 through 30. And so his faithful service is going to be that which secured to his house the succession of the priesthood according to Numbers chapter 25 
verses 11 through 30. And so let's take our Bibles and let's see what's going on in Numbers chapter 25 and what it is that Phinehas does. Look beginning in Numbers chapter 25, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. Now, this no doubt is a dark time in Israel. This in and of itself is a bloody scene on many levels, but the reason it is is because of Israel's sin. Once again, Israel wants to be like the other nations. They attached themselves to the Midianites when God had clearly told them that was not going to benefit them spiritually. It was going to drag them down, and it did just that. They attached themselves and start worshiping the false god who's known as Baal of Peor. And so God had commanded, God had already clearly told His people, not to have any interaction or relation with the heathen nations. And the reason for that is clear. It was going to hurt them spiritually and separate them further from Almighty God. And yet, in spite of God's command, Israel had become intermingled with the Midianite people of Baal of Peor, even to the point that they had taken some of these heathen women as wives and were committing idolatry with them very brazenly in front of the people and in front of God. This, of course, was done in direct violation of God's commands and in rebellion to His will. And so as a result of this sin, God commanded Moses to kill those who had committed this sin, hang their bodies out in the scorching sun for all the people to see it as an example. Did God want these people to die? Did God want the heathens to worship uh, him, uh, uh, worship this false god? Of course not. That's the last thing God wanted. But because this had already affected and infected the people of God, God had to take drastic measures to save those who were remaining. It would be like this. Let's say that in a part of the human body, let's just say in your pinky you get some disease, gangrene, cancer, whatever it may be. Would you be willing to sever that pinky to save the rest of the body? I wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to. It'd be the last thing we'd want to do. But in the process, if it would save the rest of the body, would you remove part of that pinky if it were diseased or infected? Well, sure you would. Anybody would to save the rest of the body. Friend, that's what God is having to do here 
to hopefully save the rest of Israel. And so while these men are out killing those who have gone out to worship and committed harlotry with the Moabites, you now have a prince of the tribe of Simeon by the name of Zimri. He actually is out in the open with a heathen, idolatrous woman, as it were, flaunting his relationship with her, and he brings her into his tent to commit adultery and harlotry with her inside the camp of Israel. And so not only is this man in direct violation of God and his will, he is openly, brazenly rebelling against Moses and his authority, and that's no doubt going to affect the rest of the people of Israel. And so now we enter Phinehas. Phinehas loves God. He loves the people of God. He wants to do what's right. And he knows if this doesn't stop, thousands more people are going to die. And so he rises up with great courage. He takes what we would think of as a javelin. He seeks out this man and this woman, goes into their tent and runs that javelin, kills both of them. He's enraged with righteous zeal and he does this because he doesn't want sin. He doesn't want sin to be rampant. He doesn't want any more of his people, God's people who he loves to die. And something has to be done to stop this plague. And so when Phineas knew that Zimri had taken Cosme, that's this woman's name, into his tent to commit lewdness with her, he takes that javelin and he runs it through both of them, and they both die. And you know, that kind of gets everybody's attention. That kind of helps people to realize this is wrong. This man had no right to do that. And Phinehas stood up and did something that we should have done a long time ago. And yet, it's this righteous act that actually turn back the wrath of God. I want you to hear and notice what God said about this in Psalm 106, verse 31. Here's what the scripture says. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. What was accounted to righteousness? When Phinehas stood up taking boldness and courage and doing something that no doubt he didn't necessarily want to have to do. God said that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations. Friends, because of Phinehas's courage and his zeal, God made a covenant of peace with him and his household, a covenant that would be of the everlasting priesthood as long as the Levitical priesthood stood. And so God approved of that action. Now, was it hard to do that? Sure it was. Was it something that Phinehas enjoyed? Of course not. But was it necessary to save people? It absolutely was. Now, with that background and that story and the uh, courageous account of Phinehas and what he did in mind, Let's then make some practical application for God's people, for, for us. We said from the outset, the things that were written ahead of time, before time, were written for our learning. What do we learn, practically speaking, from this example of Phinehas and the plague that was going on there, the idolatry and the sin and, and how God felt about that? Here are the practical lessons we can learn from this. First, God expects us to obey Him. Friend, it's that simple. God said to the Israelites, He commanded the Israelites several things. He said in, uh, in the Ten Commandments, I'm a jealous God, you'll have no other gods before me. They knew He was the only true and living God. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6. They, God had commanded them not to intermarry, not to worship the false gods, not to have uh, any interaction with them. They would draw them away from God and ultimately they would be lost over that. And yet they didn't do that. When God tells us something, God expects us 
to obey Him. God's Word is not just suggestions. God's Word is not just good ideas. When God says, do this or don't do this, friend, let's realize from this example, He expects us to obey Him. Let me remind you of a few New Testament passages that illustrate this point. The Bible says in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, listen to this, to all who obey Him. Hebrews 7, verses 28 and 29, He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. We must obey God through Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew 7, verses 21 following, Jesus said this, It's not everybody that just says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven. But Jesus said this then, But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus asked a haunting question in Luke chapter 6, verse number 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Is it possible to say, I'm a Christian, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and then not do what Jesus says? Well, of course not. Jesus said those ideas are incompatible. It reminds us of the words of Jesus in John 14, 15. Listen carefully to this verse. Jesus said, If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. John 14, verse number 15. Let's then make a second practical application from the example of Phinehas and the Moabites and the people of Israel here. God wants His people to be separated from the world and from sinners. Of course, the original application was to the people of Israel. Don't have anything to do with these heathens, with their false gods. Don't intermarry. Don't mingle with them. They're going to uh, infect you. And they did. 24,000 people. Listen now. 24,000 people in the camp of Israel died because they did what God told them not to do. Friend, God wants us, His people today, to be separated from the world and from sinners. How do we know that? Listen to these passages. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18 says this, Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. I'll be your God, you might, you'll be my people, says the Lord God. Listen to James 4, uh, verse number 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. And then we have 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31 through 33. The Bible says evil companions corrupts good morals. Now, friend, are we saying that a person shouldn't try to be friendly to people of the world? Are we saying that a person shouldn't try to reach out and be a good example and, and help people? That's not the idea. I'm not going to make people of this world, my closest friends, my confidants, my closest associates, and the people I'm going to let influence me in this life. God wants us still to be separate from sinners and from uh, people of the world. And then I'd like for you to consider this practical application with me. It relates in some ways to the others, but we really want to drive this point home. God meant what He said under the Old Testament, and God means what He says today. Was God just giving Israel a good guideline to follow if they wanted or not follow if they wanted when He said, don't worship idols, don't intermingle, don't be involved in idolatry and harlotry. No, 24,000 people died because they didn't take God at His word and they didn't think He meant what He said and there'd be consequences. Friend, how much more so for us today? When God says something, 
God means what he says. When God says, don't lie, the Bible tells us all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Revelation 21 verse 8. Does God really mean that or is it okay to do that sometimes? Well, friend, we've got to realize God means what he says. When God tells us today not to commit adultery, adultery, not to be involved in idolatry, not to put any other gods or anything before him, does he really mean that or is that just kind of a good, you know, we live in a world where fornication, idolatry, immorality, all kinds of things are put before God. Does God still mean what He says? Friend, He absolutely does. Those who don't... Here's what Jesus said in Mark 9, verse 44, verse 46, and verse 48. Jesus, as clearly as anybody taught, there is a place called hell where the worm dies and the fire is not quenched, and those who disobey God will be lost forever on the last day. And so part of the practical application is... God means what He says, and there will be dire consequences if we don't obey God. Are we, th are we saying today that a plague's going to start and that God's going to send us out to kill people? Friend, that's not what we're saying. We're saying this. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 3, says those who did not obey God, there were consequences that came upon them. And then he says this, how much worse punishment will be upon us? What's that worse punishment? Friend, if people live in sin and die in sin, those people are going to be separated from God eternally in everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, verse number 46. All right, let's then make a, another application from the ex great example of the zeal <coughs> of Phinehas, and it's this. Christians today have to have the courage to stand up to those living in sin among the people of God and do something about that. Again, it was Phinehas who halted that. You can just see that plague making its way across Israel, people dropping dead, and yet Phinehas stood up and halted that plague. Today, we need the courage to call out sin as sin among God's people and encourage them, make ways for them to stop that sin. Let me give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a man lot, a lot like Zimri in the Old Testament. He's taken his father's wife. He's having interrelations, uh, relations with his uh, a stepmother, we believe. And so here's a man who's taken his father's wife. They're both attending, being active, it looks like, in the assembly, and nobody's doing anything about that among the people of God, and God's angry about it. And so God, through His inspired servant Paul, says, we can't have this in essence. You've got to take this ungodly man, put him out, withdraw fellowship from him, and stand up for what's right in an attempt to save his soul. And so they were called on to stand up for right, withdraw from that ungodly man with the hope of saving his soul. Whether it be adultery, whether it be any type of immorality, lewdness, fornication, homosexuality, drunkenness, revelry, whatever the moral issue may be, we as God's people have got to stand up for what's right and true. We need the zeal and the courage to stand up and speak out about morality today. We've got to take action against that which is wrong or it's going to affect the whole congregation of God's people today. You see, zeal in doing what's right is something that ought to be commended. But oftentimes people look down on that. You know, when somebody today actually has the courage to stand up and speak out on moral issues from the Word of God, too many times we, we get embarrassed or it makes us feel uncomfortable or we say, well, they weren't being friendly when really they were just speaking the truth. Too many times we're down on people when they stand up and speak out for what's right. And yet in the Bible, 
It's that type of zeal that is commended by our God. Then realize these practical applications with me from our text. It doesn't matter who you are or how popular you are or what your position in life may be or how much clout you may have. Sin is still sin. Zimri was a prince of the tribe of Simeon. You reckon he had any money? Do you think he might have had a position of power? Do you think he might have been looked up to by others? Yeah, that's probably part of the reason why he's out doing what he's doing because he thinks, in my position, I can do this and get away with it. And yet, sin was still sin in God's sight and to Phinehas. Friend, we need to realize that when we're in positions of authority or power or influence, we need all the much more to realize our influence and how that can affect other people. And then two final applications. God remembers and He blesses those who are willing to take a stand. And friends, sometimes strong actions against sin are necessary to stop that from becoming rampant among God's people. God blessed Phinehas for that bold action he took. And sometimes that's exactly what's necessary to stop sin. Elders and local congregations of the Lord's church have a serious responsibility. Hebrews 13 verse 7 uh, following teaches they're going to give an account for people's souls. When sin is blatantly going on, Elders have to be like Phinehas and have to have the zeal to do what God wants them to do, to stand up and not allow that to go on. And God will bless us for doing that. And so as we've thought today about the example of Phinehas, what a great and courageous man he was. Friend, let's make applications to our life to have the zeal to do what's right and to follow God. If you're not a Christian, as always, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel. Do you believe in Jesus? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin? Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Would you make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ? Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Mark 16, 16. Join us next time as we look at another great Bible character. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the